Hello and good afternoon. Just check my microphone volume. Okay, not bad. Um, this is a website I found simply by searching Great Tartaria, of course in Russian, and I searched it for it in Russian on Google, and this is just a result I got, and it translates quite nicely into English, and I'm just going to read it into the video. I'm reading this for the first time, and it translates into English fairly nicely, so it's understandable, unlike my last video. Okay, uh, section one, past of our civilization, the death of Tartari, Tartary. The great Tartari, and this is this is interesting to me because this is from 2013, right? It's not brand new to me, but it surprises me that this is so far back, and I really haven't even heard a lot of this information before. A little bit shocked by that. The death of Tartari, Tartary, by Elena Lyubimova. The great Tartari, Tartary, was wiped from the face of the earth by nuclear bombings. Oh, and by the way, this doesn't reflect my personal opinion. I'm just reading what I read. On Earth, there was not always such a mess as now. Just recently, almost all of the habitable land on the planet belonged to the great Tartari, the largest country. But the parasites, both local and foreign, did not like it very much. The death of Tartary. Okay, here's some maps. For expansion of the territory of Russia... Or figure one, expansion of the territory of Russia from 1613 to 1914, official version of history. The great Tartari, Tartary disappeared from the political map of the world about 200 years ago. More precisely, it was erased from this map, figure one. Wiped so thoroughly that for almost 200 years no one has heard of it, and he did not know. So far, the work of academic Fomenko on the new chronology has not appeared, which returned to scientific circulation a lot of evidence of the existence of this state, the largest ever existed on our planet. The natural boundaries of Great Tartary, which in the Middle Ages occupied the entire northern hemisphere, were oceanic shores. See figure 2 and 3. So this is figure 2, and here's figure 3. In addition, the three oceans of the four available Arctic, Pacific, and Atlantic were in fact its internal reservoirs. By the end of the 18th century, in modern chronology, succumbing to the pernicious influence of monotheism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the population of the European part of Great Tartary plunged into the bloody horror or religious and predatory wars, political intrigues, revolts, and revolutions. It broke away from Asia. She could resist the evil onslaught of New World religions. I, I suppose it should say she could not resist the evil onslaught of New World religions and preserved the moral purity and faith of the ancestors. The border between the metropolis and the western plague-stricken lands stretched from the Arctic to the Indian Ocean. Along the Ural Mountains, the shores of the Caspian Sea, and the peaks of the Zagros. Here's a better view of the map. Again, the link is in the description below if you want to go to the website and find these pictures yourself and have a closer look, or you can pause the video. I've had a busy day here, folks. Hopefully it doesn't show in my voice, but I've just been rushing around. Okay, figure five, the Russian Empire, 1755. The last border war with Britain and Muscovy developed for the Great Tartary unsuccessfully. After suffering a series of serious defeats, she was forced to recognize the loss of some, some of her territories. In the southern Urals, in the northern Caspian, and southwestern Siberia, in central and northeast India, and on the east coast of North America. Currently, various episodes of this war, truly world in its scope and consequences, are known as the suppression of the Pugachev Rebellion and the conquest of Siberia the colonization of India, and the war for the independence of the British colonies in America. Figures 6, 7, and 8. Again, you might want to look at the website and examine these pictures more closely for yourself. Figure 8. The War of Independence of the English Colonies in North America and the Creation of the United States. Given the pathological tendency of professional historians to falsify, we can assume that it was not 
Just in case you're wondering, I have to record these video clips in five minute segments because I'm cheap and I have the free software that only is a trial so it lets me record for five minutes. Figure 8. The, the War of Independence of the English Colonies in North America and the Creation of the United States. Given the pathological tendency of professional historians to falsify, we can assume that it was not quite so, but even in case of the victory of the Anglo-Russian coalition by the beginning of the 19th century, the Great Tartary was in any way the largest and most powerful state in the world. Suppose, as an exception, that this time, for some unknown reason, official historiography describes the events that took place in reality. The Great Tartary suffered a military defeat and suffered territorial losses. So what? Such insignificant losses could not lead to the death of such a great power, even if the defeat caused a serious internal political crisis. For no domestic political crisis could lead to the collapse of the Great Tartary, because the people who inhabited Asia 200 years ago was united and completely homogeneous, and by nationality and by language and by religion. 200 years ago, only Tartar Tartars lived in the Great Tartary on the land of Tark, and Tara, figure 9. High, fair-haired, white-skinned people with cornflower green, fiery, or silver eyes. Slavs, Aryans. The Rusi. Friendly and kind-hearted in times of peace, brave and merciless in battle, just and mer merciful in the days of vi victories, of persistent in times of adversity. Because they pres preserved the moral purity and faith of their ancestors. From the Urals to Alaska, from the New Earth to Tibet. So here's a picture of Tark and Tara. In order to destroy the Great Tartary, it was first necessary to destroy its people, all, until the last man, and it was still beyond the power that his power. Neither Britain nor Muscovy, neither their coali coalition even if all the rest of Europe joined this filthy coalition. The famous commander, Alexander Suvorov, figure 10, who took part in the defeat of Bugachev, figure 11, and personally escorted him to Moscow, figure 12, could, infli could inflict a major defeat on Tartar troops. Figure 10, Alexander Vasilievich Suvorov, Prince of Italia, Earl of Rimnik, Count of the Holy Roman Empire, Generalissimo of Russian land and sea forces, General Field Marshal of Austrian and Sardinian troops, Grand Sardinian Kingdom of Prince of Royal Blood, Cavalier of all Russian military and foreign orders. Okay, here we have a picture of Emilian Pugachev, and here's another picture, figure 12, Suvorov puts Pugachev in a cage. And apparently he did, for which he was awarded a, a gold sword and diamonds. The cost of such a sword was equal to the amount of the annual salary of the whole regiment. He received several higher orders of the Russian Empire, the Order of St. Andrew, the First Order, and the Order of St. George and Vladimir of the First Class. Although the official historical science of this is and mute, I suppose is mute, saying basically we don't hear about this, like a fish about ice. More precisely, it hides the history of Tartar wars of Muscovy among its wars with the Ottoman Turks and other Crimean Khans. However, notice the brilliant port of brilliant port Russia has been at war for more than one century, but it was not able to defeat it completely. Despite the glorious victories of Rumyantsev, Zadunaisky, Orlov, Hezmensky, Potemkin, Tavritsky, Tavrichesky, Suvorov, Rimnik, Kutuzov, Smolensky, Dibich, Zabalkan, and Paskevich, Erevansky. Although the Turkish Empire, even at its peak, was ten times smaller than Tartaria. Figure 13. The Ottoman Empire, the official version. Okay. Turkey has suffered many defeats in battles, lost wars and territories, but it has not disappeared from the political map of the world.
Unlike the Great Tartary, which was erased not only from the map, Tartary was erased from the face of the earth, together with the people who inhabited it. This happened in February 1816, which later became known as the Year Without Summer. In the United States, it is still called 1800 and frozen to death, that is, 1800 and frozen to death. And official science considers the beginning of this small ice age, which lasted three years. In March, the temperature in North America continued to remain winter. In April and May, there was unnaturally a lot of rain and hail. Sudden frost destroyed the majority of crops. In June, two giant snowstorms led to the death of people. In July and August, the rivers froze, even in Pennsylvania. Every night there was a frost, and in New York and in the northeast of the U.S. fell to a meteor, to a meter of snow. Germany was tormented by violent storms. Many rivers, including the Rhine, emerged from the shores. In Switzerland, there was terrible weather. Every month it was snowing. Unusual cold led to a catastrophic crop failure. In the spring of 1817, grain prices in Europe rose tenfold and famine began among the population. The world fell into darkness, in the literal sense of the word. The sun could not break through the cloudy veil and did not warm the earth. Lord Byron wrote in 1816, The sun is shining bright, and the stars wandered without purpose and without rays. The sun is shining bright. Okay, In eternal space I drank blindly the moonless air. Hour of the morning came and went. But the day he did not bring with him the dwellings of all who have dwellings. In bonfires were formed, the cities burned, the terrible famine, terrible people, and people died quickly. The solution of the three year cold was found a hundred years later. American researcher W. Humphreys related climate change in 1816 to 1819 with the eruption of the volcano Tambora on the island of Sumbava. At present, the hypothesis is generally accepted in the scientific world, although it is unclear why the explosion of the volcano south of the equator has influenced the climate of the northern hemisphere so much. Without having any influence on the climate of the south, period. Eruptions of the same power, about 800 megatons, that occurred in Indonesia in 1883, Krakatau, <coughs> in 1912, in Alaska, Katmai, and in 1991, in the Philippines, Pinatubo, led to a drop in temperature by no more than half a degree. Figures 14, 15, 16. Not causing no midday darkness, no, sno no storms in the middle of summer, no mass exit of rivers from the coast. So this is a drawing. I, I, I mean, I don't say what you want, but I don't find drawings to be very... Okay, the eruption of the volcano of Krakatau. The eruption of the volcano of Pinatubo, 1991. And the eruption of the volcano, again, 91. It is interesting to note that while Europe and America froze and starved, in Russia, in 1816 to 1819, nothing unusual was noted, neither cold nor hunger. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and in men favor. I mean, it's as usual, and frosts and nedorod. This is Russia, yes, even after the recent invasion of the two languages and the complete ruin of the western provinces. As they say, a fresh tradition is fresh, but it's hard to believe. Even in ordinary years, the winter in Russia lasts <coughs> six months. The trunks of century-old trees crack from the frost and not to feed flour by the spring. So the point here is not in the Russian people's habit of cold and fasting, but in the absence of rotten Western democracy and the availability of reliable censorship. Meanwhile, Russia most likely was the source of climate problems of both Europe and America. What is in indirectly indicative of the age of modern forests in Russia and Belarus? which on a circle no more than 200 years. To all the forests and Siberian and Russian and Belarusian. The fact can only be explained by the fact that 200 years ago all Russian forests disappeared. Chorus. And ancient elm lives 300 years. Linden 400. Pine and lark 500. Spruce 600. Cedar 1000. Oak one and a half thousand and young. Apparently they burnt, figure 17. These fires are burning and burning, by K. Vasiliev. And the present ones have grown in their places, 
in the central Russian plain. Okay, at present ones have grown in their place. In the central Russian plain, the forest was restored in the middle of the 19th century by mass planting with versed squares, and the Siberian taiga rose itself, since there was no one to plant trees here, but more on that later. And now a few words about these, the so-called karst lakes, very common in Russia, especially near the settlements, especially in Siberia, ideally round. I have to admit this is the first time I've seen something like this. Lake Kruglo, Fokinski's district of Bryansk region, Lake Dead, Penz region of Penza region, uh, Lake Mert Mertvo, Penza region of the Penza region, Shaitan Lake, what an awful name, Muromtevsky district, region. A scratch here. often having a higher water level due to a dense bowl than the surrounding water bodies. Lakes that have risen not only over the karsts, cavities formed under the action of carbonated water in the thickness of the soluble rock, gypsum or limestone, and even where there were no karsts, and some of them were not filled with water, figure 22 and 23, funnels of unknown origin in the Seropool area. Funnels of unknown origin in the Seropool area. I've got to look this stuff up myself. Uh-oh, this is not English. Oh, I can't even translate it now. Okay. Okay, I think I fixed it. The names of these lakes are Adovo Lake, Shaitan Lake, Chertovo Lake, Dead Lake, etc. Absolutely meaningless, from the point of view of official science by itself, which did not find anything unusual in them, unlike the local population. And further, it's a strange thing, but the diameter of these lakes is well correlated with the diameter of funnels from nuclear explosions. The power is from 1 to 10 megatons, but it is so, by the way. For the sake of completeness, let's know that, an amazing coincidence, it was in the 19th century that mankind became acquainted with the cancerous diseases. Where they came from science is still unknown. Although today, none of the medical staff has any doubts that one of the main causes of cancer is radioactive radiation. In any case, the middle of the... I, I just have to say that I'm not 100% sure I agree. But anyway, what do I know? In any case, the middle of the 20th century, the outbreak of cancer was caused precisely by an increase in the radioactive background due to the nuclear tests. 2,422 nuclear and thermonuclear, including 522... 525 atmospheric figure 24 and 25 but it is not important okay is that hopefully that's not photoshopped thermonuclear explosion uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, I don't know it's a little bit photo edited don't don't get me wrong I want to believe this stuff but anyway very picturesque uh, thermonuclear explosion in the 19th century, neither Muscovy nor Britain, nor nuclear, nor thermonuclear weapons were available. Consequently, neither one nor the other could not apply it. And if they had it, given the level of philanthropy of the English co colonialists, figure 26, and the Tsarist satraps, there is no doubt about the determination to use the atomic bomb if available, even in the absence of modern means of delivery and detonation. The execution of the leaders of Sipayev revolt with the help of the Devil's Wind. Art by V. Vereshagin. But anyway, neither Muscovy nor Britain had an atomic bomb. But the reason for its use, it seems there was, and very weighty. Napoleon, figure 27, entered Moscow on September 2, after a terrible battle near the village of Borodino, Ruski troops, successfully repulsing all the attacks of the French, retaining reserves, and having at their disposal excellent positions in strong rear, expectedly withdrew, and they did not just move away, but gave the enemy the biggest city in the country to be scolded. Its historical center, which Emperor Alexander I, figure 28, publicly proclaimed the head of the other Russian cities as soon as, soon as Napoleon crossed the border. 
that he was not mistaken with the direction of the main attack, probably. Figure 29. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. Here's a picture of Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon I, Emperor of the French King of Italy. <clears throat> Figure 28, Alexander I, Blessed, the Magnanimous, Power of the Restorer, the Emperor and the Autocrat of all Russia, Moscow, Kiev, Vladimir Novgorod, Tsar of Kazan, Tsar of Astrakhan, Tsar of Siberia, Tsar of the Chersonas, of Tavria, Sovereign of Pskov, and Grand Prince of Smolensk, Lithuanian, Volin and Podolsky, Prince Estland, Livonian, Kurland, Semigol, Semogit, Korel, Tver. I don't know if I should. I'm not going to read all this. You can pause it and read it. And the invasion of Napoleon's army in Russia in 1812. Uh, Mikhail Ilyarionovich, Golenishev, Kutuzov. Sovereign Prince Smolensky, Field Marshal General of Russian Troops. The day before the disgraceful surrender of the head of all of the day before the disgraceful surrender of the head of all other cities, Commander in Chief of all Russian armies and militia, the most serene Prince of Smolensk, figure thirty. That's again this fellow recently issued by the highest decree promoted to the Field Marshal General of the Russian Empire and received 100,000 rubles for expenses, conducted a no notorious military council in Filet, or Filets, and he insisted on leaving Moscow. Despite the fierce resistance of some of his generals, young and stupid, he broke all the cries and ordered to retreat, although yesterday, in the order of August 31, vowed to give the enemy a new decisive battle under the walls of Moscow. Military Council in Philly. Artistic Director A. Kivchenko. When retreating in Moscow, more than 30,000 wounded were thrown and a huge number of weapons, 156 guns and 27,000 guns, 75,000 rifles and 40,000 sabers, 600 banners and 1,000 standards. The decision of the Field Marshal has not been unambiguously interpreted. Someone justifies it. Proceeding from the result, someone considers a traitor, which sold him... Well, I'm not going to say these things because I don't want... Uh, not that I'm against saying them, I just don't want to have my videos uh, removed. But you can read it for yourself. In the face of the French or the English, not for the snuff, at his age, having everything you want, including money, fame, orders, and titles. Why the Napoleon famous... F Why then Napoleon, famous for his determination, sat on... Poklonaya Hill and waited unknown what, not daring to enter Moscow, although I already knew that it was empty, and no one is going to organize street battles in it, despite the ancient Russian habit of fighting for every house, as it was in Smolensk and many other places. Or maybe he at last smelled a trap. Perhaps something told him that such experienced military leaders as Kutasov whom he knew well from previous wars, simply do not pass the historical centers of the homeland, especially covered with well-fortified positions, provided with strong rear, and also reserves. However, there was nowhere to go, so I had to enter Moscow, at least in order to have something to bargain in peace negotiations. By this time, Napoleon had already lost a numerical advantage, and most importantly, the confidence in victory. Of all my battles, the most horrible thing I gave near Moscow. The French in it showed themselves worthy of winning, and the Russians gained the right to be invincible, he said after the battle. Here's the Battle of Borodino, a picture by Leyden. Okay, this unfortunate bueno parte, and it was not realized that no one is going to enter into any negotiations with him, because there is no need, for everything is already predetermined. Mene Tekel Perez men, that's a quote from Daniel, yep, yeah. God numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. This is like the writing on the wall. With the mystery hand that just writes it on the wall. King Nebuchadnezzar wants Daniel to interpret his dream. Okay, 
Uh, you are weighed in scales and found very light. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to Medes and Persians. Therefore, Kutasov received an order to leave Moscow because his army completely fulfilled the task, lured the Corsican monster in. Therefore, Kutasov received an order to leave Moscow because his army completely fulfilled their task, lured the Corsican monster into a trap. Now the army had to be saved, the most shining of her the most shining of her and saved. For what he eternal memory. Because precisely the army and conducted the remnants of foreign troops back to the border. Okay, so this is the expulsion of Napoleon's army from Russia. As Muscovites, they all knew that Moscow would be abandoned. Also it is necessary to carry away legs. To not get to Buena Parte, which will not stand on ceremony and will rob, kill, and rape. So as they say, who did not hide? However, there were a few, only 20,000 townspeople. Ober Stallmeister, or Napoleon, the Marquess of Armand de Colin Court, later recalled, the city without inhabitants was surrounded by gloomy silence. During our entire long journey, we, had, we did not meet a single local resident. The trap slammed shut. The game caught. On the same night, a fire broke out in Moscow. Figures 34 and 35. The fire of Moscow, 1812. Avazovsky. Moscow. Fire. Unknown German artist. Brigadier General Count Philippe de Segur wrote in his memoirs, Two officers were stationed in one of the Kremlin buildings from where they had a view of the northern and eastern parts of the city. Around midnight they awakened by an extraordinary light, and they saw that flames were engulfing the palaces. First it illuminated the elegant and noble outlines of the architecture, and then all this collapsed. The information brought by the officers who came from all sides coincided with each other. On the first night, on the 14th to the 15th, the fireballs descended upon the palace of Prince Trubetskoy, and set this building on fire. A very strange fire, to put it mildly. Extraordinary light, fireball, flame, bringing down. Well, talking about comets here, and I've actually made videos on this previously. Yes, I was the guy that made those videos. Um, I had an old channel. I might repost them on this channel. Um, not abode huts, but multi-story buildings. Not lighting, but lighting. Lightning. Not lighting, but lightning at first, and then collapsing. As for the ball, generally without comment, I mean, guess by yourselves. From one time, what is this ball? And if you do not guess, look at the newsreels of nuclear tests. Nuclear tests. Okay. Okay, I, I didn't translate well here, so I'm going to have to refresh the page. Okay, the city, su the city center suffered most, despite the fact that it was built up exclusively by stone and brick buildings. Even from the Kremlin, almost nothing remained. Although the surrounding buildings, it was separated by wide areas and ditches. Such, for example, as Alavizov Ditch, 34 meters in width and 13 in depth, which passed from Arsenal Tower to Beklamishevskaya. This huge moat after the fire was completely filled up with debris and debris, after which it became easier to level than to clear. By the way, Napoleon, who was accused of setting fire to Moscow and Kremlin and the Kremlin explosion himself, barely survived during this fire. Be nice if there was references to some of this. Okay. Uh, the Court de Segur, the Count de Segur, which I guess is actually a German guy, not French. That's what it said. Then, after long searches, they found an underground passage near the pile of stones that led to the Moscow River. Through this narrow passage, Napoleon, with his officers and guards, managed to get out of the Kremlin. All those who survived were in a state of shock. De Segur recalls, The same of ours who used to walk around the city, now deafened by the blaze of fire, blinded by ashes, did not recognize the terrain, and besides, the streets themselves disappeared into the smoke and turned into piles of ruins. From the great Moscow, there was only a few surviving houses scattered among the ruins. This slain and burned colossus, like a corpse, made a heavy, made a heavy smell. Heaps of ash, and in some places the ruins of walls and fragments of rafters, some indicated that there used to be streets, and the suburbs came across Russian men and women covered with charred clothes like ghosts. They wandered among the ruins. Only one-third of the French army survived, as well as from Moscow. 
Further, more disease began after the fire. A Moscow resident said the barracks were littered with sick soldiers who were deprived of any supervision and the hospitals were wounded, dying hundreds from lack of medicines and even food. Uh, dying from lack of medicines and even food. The streets and soldiers, out of compassion, pinned with such coolness with which we kill the fly in the summer. The whole city was turned into a cemetery. More than 80,000 people were killed. For reference, during the atomic explosion in Hiroshima, Hiroshima, well, that's a different debate, and at this stage, uh, I'm not sure that uh, that, story's, uh, that story holds water either. So I just don't want to give too much of my own insight, but I don't, I don't believe the, the official story on that. Uh, 70,000 people died in Nagasaki, 60. Of the 9,158 buildings, 6,532 were destroyed. So some were destroyed and others weren't. I don't know if that sounds like nuclear bombing. That sounds like some other type of strategic, uh, specific site bombing. Not everything was destroyed. Why, what do I know? It wasn't there. Does, does not it remind you of anything from modern history? Not surprising. After all, the Moscow fire took a hundred and fifty years before Hiroshima, figure 38, 39, 40, 41, when neither of the tactical nuclear munitions nor radiation sickness no one had ever, had ever heard of, and he did not know because they were not there yet, or have they already been. So these are pictures of atomic explosions, Hiroshima, <coughs> after the atomic bombardment. <coughs> but, but again, how do, how do these buildings survive? Right, and even a bridge survived. I mean, that's a different discussion altogether. But anyway, Nagasaki before and after the atomic bomb bombing. So. Okay. By the way, an increased level of background radiation in the center of Moscow forms a characteristic spot with a torch stretched toward the south. Radiation background for the for Moscow. Okay. What I'm really interested in, folks, if you're listening, is actually more, yeah, like the historical details. Not so much interpretation of how things went. Uh, what am I saying? Okay. I'll leave my thoughts for later. The epicenter of this spot is located just in the same place as the windows of the two officers mentioned in the memoirs of the Count de Segura, the very ones whose eyes were first illuminated and then elegant and noble palaces collapsed, those who appeared in the epicenter. Official history, official historical science has still not found out who set Moscow on fire. The French thought that Muscovites did it themselves. I mean, who does that, right? And even shot 400 arsonists. Sounds like incendiaries. So that others could not be. Well, the shooting of the Moscow arsonists. <clears throat> the Russians believed that the Corsican monster was to blame for everything, vindictive and spiteful. Out of natural vampirism, a huge city was destroyed, and tens of thousands of people, including 30,000 owned soldiers and officers. But is it? The French had no need to set fire to Moscow. Ahead is winter and from Moscow to Paris, 666 leagues. I mean, very far away. Among other things, Moscow needed to Napoleon as a bargaining chip in the upcoming negotiations on the world. Muscovates also did not need to self-ignite. Ahead is winter, and we must somehow survive, not looking at the occupation. In addition, 30,000 wounded were left in Moscow, which almost all disappeared in the fire of a fire, together with 20,000 townspeople who did not manage to leave the doomed city. As for Emperor Alexander I, there are serious doubts about his innocence of this crime. Okay, if I'm listening again, I should probably look something like that up. That's just a note to self. On April 5th, 1813, the Emperor arrived to say goodbye to Kutuzov, who was lying at death. Behind the screen near the bed of the Prince was the clerk who was attached to him. He kept for the descendants the last conversation between Kutuzov and Alexander I. Forgive me, Mikhail Ilyarionovich, said the sovereign and the autocrat of all Russia. I forgive you, sir, but Russia will never forgive you for that, replied the field marshal. Why did the emperor ask forgiveness from Kutuzov? Perhaps for this top-secret order to abandon Moscow, or for what happened 
to her after she left. Shortly before the invasion of Alexander I said to the Austrian ambassador, I suppose that all that at the beginning of the war we are in for a defeat, but I am ready for this. Retreating, I will leave behind a desert. The bloody nightmare of the Austerlitz catastrophe permanently the nightmare of the Austerlitz catastrophe permanently placed fear in the Emperor's soul and assured Buenaparte of the invincibility. In sense, it impos in impossibility to win the Corsican monster by usual means and could push to find unusual. That obviously doesn't translate very well. Okay, when it was Alexander I, the author of the terrible trap prepared for Napoleon in Moscow, or he listened to someone's advice or obeyed someone's orders? Either way, well, that's kind of actually it's kind of neat because here you have uh, Napoleon conquering all of Europe, a story which I don't necessarily believe, and um, have a lot of questions about how such a small little man conquered so many like like fifty different military engagements, and he didn't get tired, and only at the end does he lose in Moscow. Okay, well maybe he did his job and they decided to to get rid of him. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to think. I uh, just came to my mind now. Maybe I should hold back comments. Okay, so anyway. Was Alexander the one... Okay, the author. Okay, I think I read that. Either way, at least the emperor had to know about her. Therefore, he ordered the surrender of the Holy See to Napoleon, dumping all responsibility for this on Kutuzov. The latter, by the way, is quite understandable. If the purpose... If the proposal to surrender Moscow sounded from the mouth of the king, it would not last for long for him to reign. Even the enormous authority and fame of Kutuzov hardly survived the severity of this decision. The master is weak and crafty, bald, dandy, the enemy of labor, unintentionally warmed by glory, the height would have been simply crushed. In the literal sense of the word, I mean an officer's scarf. How it happened with his father ten years ago. I'm not sure I'm following what's being explained here. Okay, so who organized such a terrible trap for Napoleon? Cui protest. Look for someone who benefits, said the ancient Romans. Who was profitable to destroy the Corsican villain? Who was the most bitter enemy of the usurper? Modern historians laugh at the stupid Bueno Parte, who, after the Battle of Borodino, sat on Poklonaya Hill and waited for the boyars to bring him to the keys of Moscow, figure 44. Napoleon is in Moscow waiting for the deputation of the boyars. And really, it's funny, after all, the Russian Empire, for a th for hundred years, there were no boyars. In Russia, indeed, there were no boyars, no voivods, and in the great Tartary? The enemy of enemy is my friend. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. It is therefore not surprising that Napoleon sought an alliance with the power that had recently fought with Britain and Russia, counting with its help to smash both, and to realize its cherished dream, to take out the British crown, its best pearl, I mean India. If the military alliance of France and Tartaria had taken place, the possessions of the East India Company in India would very soon change owners. The English Prime Minister, Earl of Liverpool, figure 45, so I should show him here, formed his cabinet in June 1812, and he ruled for almost 15 years. In the previous government, he was the Minister of War and Minister of the Colonies. Before that, he was the Minister of the Interior. He managed to solve the most important foreign policy problems of England to weaken France and Russia as much as possible, and to destroy the Great Tartary is the most terrible threat to the Indian colonies. So here's Robert Banks Jenkinson, Earl of Liverpool. I guess this is the Earl of Liverpool, Prime Minister of Great Britain, 1812 to 1827. The observance of British interests in Russia was followed by messenger Count Catcart, figure 46. I'm going to get to him, who was famous for the outstand for outstanding in its cruelty and senseless senselessness of bombing of Copenhagen in September 1807, when in just three nights, 50. English battleships made 14,000 onboard volleys and raised a third of the Danish capital to the ground. Sounds like British grenadiers. They like bombing stuff, blowing stuff up. There's songs about that. Prior to that, Cathcart managed to excel in the war with the British colonies in North America, fought in Spain and Flanders, and dealt with anti-British performance in Ireland. 
for which he was made the complete generals and dedicated to the Knights of the Order of the Thistle. That's like the, uh, the Scottish Order, I think. In the in the Canadian coat of arms, there's three different. Um, traditionally, there's three different. Okay, continuing reading. Uh, William Shaw. Oh, this that's the probably the painter, Count Cathcart, Baron Greenock. During the invasion of Napoleon, Lord Cathcart was in the retinue of Alexander I, and it's in September 1813, on the first anniversary of the Moscow Fire, the highest edict was granted to the St. Andrew's Ribbon. It's, uh, St. Andrew's is coming up a lot, and that's interesting because even when I went to the cemetery locally, uh, there's all kinds of Order of St. Andrew's kind of gravestones from like over 100 years ago that show up. Of course, the flag of Scotland has the cross of St. Andrew on it. And But anyway, General Field Marshal Rum Yantsev was awarded the Order of St. Andrew, the first called for the capture of Kohlberg during the Seven Years' War, Prince Potemkin for the victory of the Russian-Turkish War, and the Kuchuk Kainarji Peace Treaty. Suvorov for the defense of Kinburn and for the Foksani. It is interesting for what such feats of the highest order of the Russian Empire the English envoy was honored. Apparently for timely advice about the trap and for also for organizing the procedure, more precisely for mediation and its organization. Because the main role in the Moscow tragedy was played by other forces. In addition to Britain, Napoleon had another powerful enemy. Much more vindictive and dangerous, the Rothschild brothers, figure 47, did not receive Russian orders, and nowhere in connection with the campaign of Napoleon to Moscow was not mentioned. But its defeat could not do, and did the cost without their participation? Well, it's saying things like that, but it's actually not really um, backing up this story as to how it's connected to the war in Moscow. Just because you sort of juxtapose it with that information doesn't mean it's true. So this hasn't really been proven. But anyway, well maybe it's, he's go about to do this. Okay, I gotta be careful what I say because I don't want to have my video targeted. So I'm just gonna pause and see if I want to read this into the video. Okay, yeah, there's just a few things I couldn't read into the video and if you're really interested you should probably go look at the original uh, article itself, right? I just don't want my video to get removed. But I will continue with the reading at this point. Before this treatment, Buenaparte Parte did not show his vile anti-Semitic nature, and even the other way around. For the first time, with representatives of the most persecuted nation in the world, he met only during the Italian campaign when he was 28 years old, and immediately took them under protection. And since then, he has supported in every way whatever his army turned out to be and even promised to restore the Sanhedrin and the Jewish state in Palestine, but he did not last long. After the Alsatian, Alsatian treatment, the fate of the brave Corsican upstart, who lost his nose after countless victories in Europe, was solved. Victories suddenly ended. Slava rolled down the slope, period. In less than three years, his empire was shaken by the most severe economic crisis. The population was dissatisfied. Attempts fo followed one after another. The Russian Tsar, who was also recently sworn in eternal love in Tilsit, suddenly became insolent, and he refused to give his sister for him, for one, then the second, clearly bursting into a scandal, and yet managed to achieve this. Buenaparte gathered troops, moved to Moscow, and he climbed into the trap pre prepared for him. Okay, hold on. Okay, the rest was a... I skipped a part there. The rest was a matter of technique, in the literal sense of the word. During the Napoleonic invasion and the foreign campaign, the irrevocable losses of the Russian army amounted to about 300,000 people. Despite the presence of a huge number of archival documents, memoirs, and scientific works on the history of the Patriotic War of 1812, the total losses incurred by Russia during the invasion are unknown. They can be assessed only indirectly. Based on the results of audits conducted in 1811 and 1816, the loss of the population of Russia over this period amounted to more than 3 million people 
2, with a total strength of 36 million. In other words, almost 10% of the population died, as much as during the Great Patriotic War. How to explain such a number of dead and dead from disease, cold and hungry? Corsican monster, for all its vampirism, the local population did not touch. Uh, retreating Ru okay, I'll pause it for a sec. Retreating Russian troops arranged on the orders of Alexander I. Retreating Russian troops arranged on the orders of Alexander I. Blessed, magnanimous, magnanimous, magnanimous powers of the rehabilitant scorched desert along the old Smolensk road burned hundreds of cities and villages, but the inhabitants still were not shot, in any case until the complete expulsion of Napoleon. Official historical science somehow vaguely expounds the reasons for the ending the guerrilla war, say, drove the adversary and it all ended immediately. Woods went to kindling, kindling and swords to plowshares as useless. Why did the peasants who had just defended their land with weapons in their hands, figure 48, again surrendered to the mercy of the beast serf owners? This is Russia, still not forgotten, Raisin and Pugachev, and always ready for the last decisive, I mean, to senseless and ruthless. Probably a little bit of sarcasm in the writing, but it doesn't translate so well. Even in the most peaceful time, as it already happened more than once before and after 1812. So this is a picture that says, Do not zamai. Zamai? I don't know what that word means. Let me come. Look that word up in Russian. Okay, historians write of the loss of the civilian population of Russia in the severe winter of 1812-1813, or maybe the People's War has not calmed down by itself, and 10% of the population died not from cold and hunger, I mean, not only from them. 1,800 and frozen to death claimed tens of thousands of lives in Europe, in North America, in Russia. <coughs> the bill went to the millions, and even more lives this year carried away in Tartaria. Academic Fomenko in his works expressed the hypothesis that the Great Tartary was defeated and divided between Russia and the United States immediately after the defeat of the Pugachev Rebellion. If we assume that this is so, a number of questions arise. Why after the death of Great Tartary se several smaller states did not emerge on its territory, as it usually happens after the collapse of empires? Roman, Ottoman, Austro-Hungarian, German, Russian, British, or in the collapse of large countries, the Soviet Union or Yugoslavia? Why, after suffering a military defeat, proud and freedom-loving Tartars submitted to cruel conquerors and did not raise the club of people's war, as the Slavs, Arias, always do in such situations? Why did the real development of new lands in Russia and the United States begin only in a half century? in only in a half a century. And finally, the most important, why the endless space from the Earls to Alaska were deserted? Why did the hundred and one million more crushed Tartars go? Or where? I read that wrong. Where did the hundred and one million more crushed Tartars go? In addition, Fomenko's hypothesis leaves aside a number of important facts already mentioned earlier. A year without summer, two hundred year old forests and karst lakes, and an outbreak of cancer. Even after a even after half a century, the development of new lands was only of a cartographic nature, both in Russia and in the USA, because neither the US nor Russia nor the occupation simply did not have the resources, neither human nor material. Not to mention, scroll, not to mention the constant threat of popular unrest in the occupied territories. If only the small ethnic groups of the north and the, at least some Slav Aryans survived on these territories. By the way, why did the northern nationalities become so small? In North America, the occupiers mercilessly destroyed the local population west of the Appalachians, or Appalachia. However, the Russian Empire was not convicted of genocide. Nevertheless, all the northern peoples of Asia, which survived after 1816, have since been on the verge of extinction. Now, suppose that the Great Tartary was not divided 
either in 1775 or later. I lost the next war and suffered territorial losses, but it remained a single state, as before the largest in the world. Still dangerous for the Russian Empire and the British, the Romanovs were afraid to lose the usurped throne, and the Hanover dynasty was trembling for its Indian colonies. And then the chimera of the French Revolution gives rise to the Corsican monster, which only dreams of one thing, to deprive Britain of all things that it cannot do. I mean, take the best pearl out of her crown. Soon, Napoleon negotiates with Paul No. 1, figure 49, on a joint Indian campaign, which is broken only because of the murder of the Russian emperor. Almost done this whole page, just a little longer. Okay, so which is broken only because of the murder of the Russian emperor. As a result, the conspiracy, as a result of the conspiracy organized and paid for by Britain. So this is Paul number one, emperor and autocrat of the All Russia, Moscow, Kiev, Vladimir Novgorod, Tsar of Kazan, Ostrakhan, and then you can read the rest. It's just too much to read. But failure does not stop the stubborn Corsican. Disappointed with the new Russian Tsar, Buenaparte is ready to conclude an alliance with the great Tartarus, and he undertakes a campaign against Moscow, after the capture of which for his legions opens a direct road to India. Is this that why the great is that why the great army of Napoleon was so great that it was not only Russia that was to overcome it, and it's almost half the world? It is hard to imagine that the more terrible nightmare of the unhappy Hanover dynasty, a huge French Tartar army under the general command of the most brilliant military commander of all, times and peoples, whose rear is provided with the entire military and economic potential of the great Tartary and its dominions, the free and Chinese Tartars, and the unhampered advancement to the Indian Ocean, their diplomatic support. Was this not the nightmare that finally left King George number 3, figure 50? This is King George III of Britain, King of Hanover, Duke of Braunschweig, Lüneburg. Braunschweig. <laughs> However, the main reason for what happened in 1816 was still not in this. The people of Great Tartary stood under the evil onslaught of a new world religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam preserved the moral purity and faith of their ancestors and would never allow worms and locusts to engage in usury and extortion to rob villages and to introduce slavery on their land, in the country that was the largest in the world. By 1812 it became absolutely clear that it was impossible to defeat Bonaparte on land. The Emperor of the French, the King of Italy, the Protector of the Rhine, etc., knelt all of Europe except Britain. Someone at attached to France, someone imposed on the rulers of their relatives, someone forced to join the continental blockade. Cui protest. Look for someone to benefit. Who, in the end, won as a result of the victory over Napoleon and the destruction of the Great Tartary along with all its population? Without a doubt, Britain. Or is it the Rothschild family? However, to paraphrase the classic, you can say, I say, Britain, I mean Rothschilds, I say Rothschilds, I mean Britain, because by 1816, after the famous exchange swindle of Nathan Roth Rothschild associated with the Battle of Waterloo, Britain had taken over the above-mentioned family. Britain had taken over the above-mentioned family, okay. Since the that moment, Britain has ruled seas for almost a hundred years. I'll show this picture, uh, has almost has ruled seas for almost a hundred years. Figure 51-52, and the Rothschilds ruled Britain, and no one was not an edict. The Great Tartary was wiped off the face of the earth. France defeated. Russia, until the end of the 19th century, could not recover from the invasion, provoked by Alexander I, and when it recovered, the Rothschilds gave her new, no less destructive problems. Expansion of the British Empire after the destruction of Great Tartary. Okay, that's cool. the British Empire, okay, as for Napoleon, after the, after the Moscow fire, he lived for another nine years, and he died barely overstepping half a century boundary, figure 53. In the last years of his life, his health was greatly shaken, although before this fire, he did not complain. Official science has not established the reason for the premature death of the Emperor of the French. Someone thinks that the jailers poisoned him with arsenic. Some thinks...
Someone thinks that he died of cancer. Someone thinks that both of them and the others. The death of Napoleon. However, it may very well be that Napoleon suffered the fate of Hibakusha. No idea what that is. As, a, as mentioned above, during the atomic explosion in Hiroshima, 70,000 people died in Nagasaki, 60. But the list of victims of nuclear strike is far more exhausted. The total number of Hibakusha people who were exposed to the explosion, who di I guess that's a Japanese word, who died during the next five years from radiation sickness and other long-term consequences of atomic bombings amounted to more than 250,000 people. The total... should be the last segment here. The total power of nuclear charges applied in the winter of 1816 through the territory of Great Tartary, which burned out all of Russia's forests and caused a three-year nuclear war in the Northern Hemisphere, according to the calculations of climatologists, was about 800 megatons. In other words, 40,000 Hiroshima... Okay. Part of the funnels left after the explosion and turned into karst lakes indicate the use of not only nuclear, but also thermonuclear munitions. The power is from 1 to 10 megatons, but even in this case, the, the mentioned number of bombs had to suffice for the guaranteed destruction of all the settlements of the Great Tartary. Both large cities and small skeets, period. A large stanitsas and individual farms, and noble Kremlins and small border jails. That is why, after the death of the Great Tartary, several smaller states did not emerge on its territory, as it usually happens after the collapse of empires or the disintegration of large countries. That's why Tartars did not raise the cudgel of people's war, as the Slavs areas always do in the case of military defeat. That is why the vast expanses from the Urals to Alaska in the middle of the 19th century, when their development began, were practically uninhabited. Figure 54. Valkyrie over the defeated soldier. Artist K. Vasilev. Hopefully I'll be able to read all this. Okay. The overwhelming majority of the population of Great Tartary was burnt in the fire of atomic explosions. That explains the absence of the remains of millions of dead. The survivors suffocated in the smoke of fires or died of cold and hunger, and also from radiation sickness and cancer, and they were devoted to the fire cleansing of flames of comrades. For the accomplishment of Crota, department to the Rota, by means of the funeral pier, is a holy duty and sacred duty of every Slav Arius towards his dead or dead brethren. At the same time, the last of the survivors, realizing that for him there will be no one to arrange crod, could commit self-immolation. A huge blossoming country overnight was turned into, a radi into radioactive ashes, and they remained for many years. But the years passed. In the place of the burnt forests, the taiga has risen. Funnels turned into lakes, and most of the radioactive isotopes broke up. The radioactive background in the epicenter of the nuclear explosion does not remain high for long. The main isotopes decay fairly quickly. The activity of cesium-137 drops twofold in 30 days, strontium-90 in 29, cobalt-60 in 5 years, and yoda-131 in 8 days. That is why the development of boundless spaces from the Urals to Alaska began only in the middle of the 19th century, when the radioactive background fell finally to a safe level, but even half a century later the settlers did not venture to approach the strange round lakes, which are not known for being formed in the most convenient places for settlement, and gave these lakes absolutely meaningless names, Adova Lake, Shaitan Lake, Devil's Lake, Dead Lake, etc. Interesting words, these are all... Okay, maybe that's just selective names of lakes that the author's chosen. He's actually mentioned this already. I guess she wrote it. The woman. So let's combine the disparate facts together. In 1816, a nuclear winter began in the northern hemis hemisphere, lasting three years. Shortly before this, the world's largest state has disappeared from the face of the earth along with its entire population. At the same time, all Russian forests were burnt, and a lot of strange round depressions and karst lakes appeared. Resettlement of the deserted land became only half a century later. And any mention of Great Tartary and Tartars were banned. What happened? If you reject all the impossible hypotheses, then the remaining 
than the remaining, no matter how small its probability is the truth. The lands of Tark and Tara were subjected to massive atomic bombardment. Again, my personal opinion that nuclear weapons debatable and the nature of nuclear weapons, I still, these days I'm starting to question, but you know, maybe it is possible that there was still bombardment and bombing, because that certainly took place in the 1800s. And if you don't believe that, just listen to the old British songs like British, British Grenadiers. And anyway, okay, probably gonna have to make another video if I keep talking. But in the 19th century, neither Russia nor Britain did not yet possess nuclear weapons, and they could not apply it. So what applied it? No hitters? Anno et queptus, the Enterprise, have agreed, as the ancient Romans would say, figure 55. Okay, I don't know if I read that very well. Okay, figure 5, Anno et queptus. At the request of those who have contact with the uppermost part of the pyramid, the Great Seal, Slavic Aryan State, was destroyed by those above and observing what was going on. As for 1812, a silver medal was instituted in memory of him, equal to all, and for the militia, for the soldiers, and for the generals. First, on the obverse, wanted to put the profile of the reigning sovereign and the autocrat, as was always done in such cases. cases earlier, but Alexander the Blessed ordered another image, figure 56, and to dislodge the words from the Psalm of David, not to us, not to us, but to your name. Okay, my Russian's not so fantastic, but let's just read this. Uh, Nename, Nename, a imeni tvoime, tvoime, that's an interesting metal. Okay, this come this brings the article to a close. P.S. A skeptical reader might think that the author outlined in this article the plot of his next novel in the genre of alternate history. Alternative history. I have to disappoint to disappoint him. An alternative history is now taught in schools and universities and broadcast on Zomboy Zombayachku Chiku and about and about what was happening in the world, in fact, we are just beginning to learn. Well, that much is true. Okay, thank you for listening, if you've listened this far, and uh, hope you learned something. Life training for success.